With your host, Andrew Donaldson, this is Herd Tell. Uh, welcome back to Herd Tell. Okay, new face. Love getting new contributors on, but he's from an old group of friends. He's a Young Voices contributor. He's up in Michigan at the University of Michigan at Ann Arbor, although for the purposes of this conversation, we will not hold that against him because it ain't his fault that Rich Rod went up there. Uh, Karim Rafai, how are you, my friend? Thank you so much for joining the program. I'm good. How are you? Thank you so much for having me. I'm good. Uh, I wish we didn't have to talk about this kind of a topic, but we do because it's the kind of world we live in. You're writing in the Detroit News about it. I want to preface it with this because you've already wrote this piece a, a few days ago. But just in the few days since you read it, th it's all over the news. Protests, dissidents, crackdowns on protests, how authoritative regimes like China, like Vladimir Putin, like others, are extending their reach into Western nations to try to cut down on dissent. This is something, obviously, you probably started researching this a week or two ago. This is something that's going to accelerate in the coming weeks, I think. Is that how it feels to you, too? For certain, yeah. And like I say in the piece, you know, we're all aware that these regimes crack down on dissent within their own borders. But I really wanted to call attention to kind of this growing phenomenon of what drew the guy I interviewed and I call the export of repression abroad. That's a great term. You should uh, trademark that real quick or maybe get the <laughs> domain name for it because that's exactly what they're doing. We throw around terms like um, colonialism and imperialism. But then when you look at China, where well, they're being imperialistic about things, but they're being imperialistic about repression and about controlling speech and narratives and things like this. That's part of what you're getting at here in the bigger picture before we get into the specifics of this piece. In the modern world with modern technology, they have to fight with information. They're trying to sequester free speech. That's nothing new in history, but it's very different in the modern age. And they're not just content to do it in their own countries. They're going worldwide with it. Absolutely. What's the first thing you hit on when you went to look at this? I want you to tell us the story, because I think things like this, we get a little buzzwordy on them sometimes. Of course, the old thing about, you know, a million people is a statistic. One man's a tragedy. You highlight this guy in England and he was protesting and he got snatched up, but it's also indicative of this tactic that's been used. Tell us the story of this guy and why you started out with it to bring attention to this issue. For sure. Um, so his name is Drew Pavlou. He is an Australian uh, pro-democracy activist. Uh, he's made headlines for a couple of years now. Famously, he um, was removed from Wimbledon after um, holding up a sign, I believe, that said, where is Peng Shui, that um, famous Chinese tennis player who lodged sexual assault allegations at a top CCP official. So he's been uh, in the public eye for a while now, um, and I've gotten to know him recently pretty intimately. And um, a few months ago now, or a couple of weeks ago, he was protesting in front of the Chinese embassy in London and essentially what happened was a fake bomb threat under his name was emailed to the embassy. The embassy called the police. He was arrested. He was in you know, jail for 24 hours, like no access to uh, consular assistance. Um, he was in a whole bunch of legal trouble. The authorities were not you know, believing his story that this was a fake threat. Um, he was essentially trapped in London for almost a month because of court dates. He was told, you know, if he left the country, he may be arrested. Um, and all of this just sparking from him standing outside an embassy with a couple of flags um, ended up with him being arrested for, like, uh, threatening to commit a terroristic act. And the thing about this is, and as you detailed it, the reason we know this was probably a setup is because the Chinese officials, the CCP and their intelligence and their security apparatus, they've targeted him before. So the fact that he was just standing out there, they knew they knew well and good who this guy was. And they made sure it was a very specific. Oh, this is the guy that did that. Right. 
Absolutely. And the exact same thing happened to him again this week in Australia, another fake bomb threat under his name. But now finally, you know, authorities have caught on that this is, you know, a targeted campaign against him. So um, he's not facing really any legal trouble from what I know now. But yeah, it just continues. The thing about this is this is almost like the swatting tactic we've seen in American domestic politics. But on an international level, this has extreme consequences. Like you said, he's an Australian, so he's a Commonwealth guy. He should be able to travel. This could prevent him from traveling. This is very much a way of trying to tap down dissent because the reason they go after a high profile dissenter like him is because if you can get him, then the rest are quiet. We just had on our program talking about Hong Kong with Francis Wei, and then they're like, look, when they took out the top 50 or 60 organizers, all the protests in Hong Kong stopped. This is a pattern. This is something the Chinese Communist Party has down to a science. They know what they're doing doing this. And the pattern is something we should see to see how it's reaching out worldwide. And you touch on that. Absolutely. Um, like you mentioned with Hong Kong, diaspora communities have been targeted for a really long time now. Uh, Uyghurs, Hong Kongers, uh, Taiwanese people, um, especially on college campuses too. There's you know the CSSA, uh, which is the Chinese Student Scholars Association, which you know there's a bunch of accusations that the Chinese government uses that organization on campuses to spy on dissent um, from students. So uh, Drew kind of also drew that to my attention as well, that a lot of the diaspora communities in the UK and in Australia have been constant targets by the CCP, even once they've left China's borders. And what does he say when you talk to him? Again, put a personal face on this because we, we understand the geopolitics of it. We understand the human rights issue part of it. Well, most people that are functional adults that aren't wicked understand it. There's some people in the world that don't. When you're talking to him, what comes across, like what drives people to keep dissenting like this? Is it the people he knows personally? Is it just the wrongness of it? When you're talking to somebody like that one-on-one, -on -one, not through a news story, not through a written piece, not through propaganda videos and YouTube, both for and against, what is it that comes across? Um, yeah, like you mentioned, he's made a lot of close connections with people from those diaspora communities. And when you talk to them and you hear their stories, it's impossible not to empathize. You know, as a Syrian too, like I'm a part of a diaspora community from an authoritarian country. And when I tell my story to people who are not Syrian, um, I see that kind of empathy in Drew as well, even though he's not Chinese and he's, you know, from Australia, born and raised from what I know. Um, you can just really tell he has a lot of empathy and he's heard a lot of personal stories from, you know, Tibetans and Uyghurs, et cetera. Let me ask you about that because, um, you know, Syria and Assad and Russia and ISIS, that was just a brutal mix of basically all the world's worst actors converging. And the Syrian people ended up paying a heavy, heavy price, a massive price in death in wiped out cities. We'll probably never know the actual death toll. When you're talking to somebody who maybe doesn't follow politics, especially world politics, and doesn't even know something like that even exists, How's it hit you? Do you feel a, do you just not want to talk about it? Do you feel a responsibility as somebody in a diaspora community of, I need to explain to them why this is so important. Talk about that because I've talked to so many people in these kind of communities. We've had them on the show before and they all talk about it. It's like, this isn't really what I want, but I feel a burden about this sort of thing. I feel like I'm representative of it. How do you carry that burden? And do you feel it? Um, I definitely feel like I have an obligation to speak up for people in Syria who never had the chance to, um, especially for my family as well. They've gone through a lot. And, you know, I was privileged enough to be born in the United States. So it's kind of like a survivor's guilt kind of thing. You know, if my parents didn't choose to immigrate here, I probably would have been born in Aleppo and who knows where I would be right now. So it does kind of come out of not only a feeling of obligation, but I want to share my story and the story of other Syrians and what they've gone through because, you know, my ultimate goal is to make sure that what happened in Syria doesn't happen ever again anywhere else. And that's why I have a lot of empathy, you know, for these um, diaspora communities from China and from Taiwan and from Hong Kong, because, you know, their plight is, it's different, but it's similar, this, you know, 
reverberating effect of authoritarianism, even when you're diaspora, it still affects you every single day. So, yeah. And what you're saying about survivors guilt is the same thing. A lot of those people have said when we've interviewed them and talked to them or even talked to them offline, just prepping. Yeah, obviously, Syria was is a terrible thing. When you see that's kind of the end game of it, though, where you just have leveled sit. Literally, you talk about Aleppo, like just rubble for most of it, unfortunately. Talk about for somebody who just can't draw the line, no matter how you explain it to them, is like the reason you have to stand up to a bomb threat in London, the reason you have to stand up to Putin in Ukraine before it gets to that shooting war, before you get to tens of thousands of dead, before you get to a level cities. This quieting of dissent is how that starts. You draw that straight line in your advocacy. You've done it on your Twitter account. You do it in this piece. But just explain to people that's why this is so important because that is how, you know, that crushing of dissent is what leads to those level cities every single time. Absolutely. Yeah. You know, it's not always the most attractive and appealing thing to, you know, call out foreign human rights abuse when it's not trendy. You know what I mean? So Ukrainian activists have been talking about Ukraine since the annexation of Crimea, and they've been largely ignored. They've been warning us about Putin for years. Syrian activists, the exact same thing. We've been warning about Russia for years, largely ignored. And until Russia actually mobilizes a full invasion of a European country is when it becomes trendy and sexy to talk about, oh, Russia is so bad, we need to do something about Russia, et cetera, et cetera. When in reality, if we had jumped to action like we should have years ago, we wouldn't be at the place where we are today with entire cities in Ukraine and Syria being leveled and thousands, tens of thousands of people being dead. Yeah, unfortunately, you're correct. Uh, Kareem Rafai joining us on Herd Tale. We're going to take a quick commercial break. We come back. There's more in this piece. He talks about Iran. We're going to talk some more about China. We're going to talk some more about dissidents and Russia. All three of those heavily in the news cycle right now. We're going to work through them with our friend Raheem Jig, Young Voices contributor. Great conversation, deep conversation, but an important one to have. Heard Tell continues right after this. American Giant makes great clothing, sweatshirts, jeans, and more right here in the U.S. Visit American-Giant.com and get 20% off your first order with code STAPLE20. That's 20% off your first order at American-Giant.com, code STAPLE20. Vacation starts with VA. One thing you'll love about your trip to Virginia is that you'll never have to settle for one thing. All that you love is all in one trip. Start yours at Virginia.org. Now, welcome back to Herd Tell, continuing our conversation with Kareem Rafai. He's up in Michigan right now, but he's talking about dissent, talking about authoritarianism, talking about protesting them and the very real cost that protest can have. Um, on that vein, we've got it right in the news right now as we're speaking, really, in Iran. We have massive protests, the death of a woman at the hands of the morality police, they call it. She died in custody, and especially the women. And others are protesting back. They're getting killed in the streets for it. We've seen this before in 2019. We've seen it before other times in Iran where they'll do this really brutal crackdown. When you're talking about dissent and how important it is and protesting, how's it hit when you see something like this? Because, you know, let's be honest here. Sometimes protesting gets a little performative and there's actually a protesting industry. But when you see this kind of bravery, women ripping off their hijabs and cutting their hair in public and this sort of thing. Boy, that really hits home on how important this stuff is to me. How's it hit with you, though? Absolutely. Absolutely. I mean, they are the peak of bravery. People standing up in regimes as repressive as Iran's and, you know, openly flouting, um, you know, the most repressive laws. It, it really is inspiring. And that's why I, in this article, I talked to Drew specifically about Iran and the silencing of a set of dissent in Iran and abroad. 
Um, and the case of Masih Alinejad, who is a Iranian women's rights activist here in the US, who faced not even her first assassination attempt um, a couple of weeks ago. Um, yeah, I mean, it really has come full circle that, you know, just a couple of weeks after the assassination, oh, the assassination attempt of um, Masih Alina Jad and also Salman Rushdie, that we have these mass protests in, um, in Tehran. Compare and contrast those two, because hers you heard almost nothing about. And I watch a lot of news and I heard nothing about it. Rusty obviously got international headlines. Of course, he's been under a fatah for what, 40 years now. So that one got a lot of headlines. Why do you think certain ones of those hit the headlines and certain one of them don't? Now, also, Rusty's was on video, so that's part of it, to be fair. And he's a much higher profile. But the core problem, what the Iranian regime was trying to do there, it's the same thing, isn't it? Exactly. So it doesn't matter how high of a profile the person is. We need to be paying attention to every act of Iranian sponsored terror on our soil, whether it be a famous author like Rishti or a prominent activist like Masih Alina Jad. We need to be paying attention to Iran's actions on our own soil. It's a violation of our sovereignty. It's a violation of our freedoms. Um, and it's it's honestly egregious that an Iranian American activist, she I believe is an American citizen, is at threat of being gunned down in her own home in New York because she said something negative about a regime thousands of miles away. Now, to come back to China for a minute, we know Vladimir Putin has executed and tried to assassinate people through various poisonings and other matters. Uh, we know the Iranians have been doing it for decades. The Chinese are more subtle about this, but it's no less wicked and evil what they're trying to do with dissent. Their methods are different. Like, you know, Russia, Russia invaded Ukraine. China's trying to do this, you know, economically and influence wise. They don't really want a shooting war uh, they, they, because it's bad for business. But the spirit of authoritarianism, the same problem, the same human rights issues, it's all there. It's just wearing a different coat and using a different method, isn't it? Absolutely. You're right. It's a lot more covert on the end of China. Um, I think the bomb threat, um, the faux bomb threat in the case of Drew Pavlou is, you know, one of the more open flouting of their anti-democratic activities abroad. But um, like I talked to Drew, um, most of their action is covert. So they have, you know, people on college campuses reporting to them about um, Chinese students who are, you know, talking about Tiananmen Square or criticizing the CCP. They have professors we've seen in the past few years that are conducting uh, academic espionage. Uh, they're a lot more covert about it. They're not like Iran sending assassins to people's doors in New York City. Now, you also, you talked about talking to Drew about uh, his struggle. You also talked to a Chinese Australian dissident, Vicky. Uh, I'll let you pronounce the name because I'll butcher it too, who's been the subject of Chinese state media smear campaign and serial harassment. I got to imagine, although the case is different and the methods are a little different, boy, it sure sounds like a lot of the same things because the way you harass and crush to sin is pretty universal, isn't it? Tell us about her story like you did with Drew. Put a human face on that one. I actually, I didn't speak with Vicky, but Drew is a close uh, friend of hers. She's a pretty prominent um, anti-CCP activist who has been relentlessly harassed by um, agents of the CCP, her personal text messages being publicized on Chinese social media, uh, you know, her personal devices being hacked, just systematic harassment. There's no other way to describe it. I can't even imagine being in the situation that she's been in. Um, but yeah, she, her story is just one of many that Drew shared with me of um, Chinese diaspora communities and Chinese dissidents being relentlessly targeted by the CCP apparatus abroad. Yeah, you also made a point to kind of draw these uh, desperate threads together. You know, the the, the uh, wannabe assassins of Rushdie and Alinajad, they're going to be brought to justice because they were caught. You know, they were literally caught in the act. But when it's the CCP calling in a bomb threat, when it's them crushing dissent, when it's them using things like diplomatic immunity to cover their uh, actions in foreign countries, we're not going to get a quick, clean justice in that way. So how do you fight back against it? 
Absolutely. And I, I draw this, you know, I draw attention to that in the piece because we need to start holding these regimes accountable for crimes they're committing essentially on our soil and against our own citizens. Um, it's not enough to just prosecute their agents. We also need to start holding the governments that are the ones funding and sending these people out to harass American and Western citizens. That needs to be something that we peg to our diplomacy. You know, how are we going to negotiate deals with someone like, you know, uh, Raisi in Iran when he's sending assassins to kill random American citizens? It's absurd. Yeah. And the reason we don't do that is because, you know, Iran is obviously a player in the Middle East trying to always keep that delicate balance going. We know the issues with them in Israel. We know the issues with them in the Saudis. It's a complicated thing. So that that balance buys them a lot of their human rights violations. China buys theirs economically. People are mm -hmm. afraid to upset. They want to do business with China. So they buy theirs economically. You just mentioned the president of Iran. We just had the incident in New York City. Christina Amanpour, the well-known reporter, refused to wear a headscarf to the interview, and he stormed off mad and refused to do it, basically, or his staff did. That doesn't sound like a big protest compared to the economic stuff and the human rights stuff and peace in the Middle East. But what you're saying, little things like that publicly to leaders that make them lose face, which is something they do care about, I think that does matter. How does it land with you, though? Absolutely. You know, I'm more enthusiastic than anyone to see the now mainstreamed upheaval against the Iranian government right now in the US. And I hope it lasts because we can't go weak. There's no more time for weakness. Too many people have died at the hands of the Iranian regime for us to take a step back and give them a boatload of concessions. So seeing this mainstreamed upheaval against not only Raisi, but you know the government of Iran over what's been going on in the past week, it's, it's really great to see. Um, Kareem Rafai joining us. Now, you've gotten to talk to dissidents like Drew. You've got a little bit of a network. You're from a diasporic community. Not everybody listening to that has those kind of connections. What can someone do to affect it just in their social media, in their conversations, in the discourse, in the way they talk about these things? Just kind of the average person who you know doesn't have political connections and maybe doesn't think they have a dog in the fight other than maybe they do care about freedom. Tell them a few things they can do that actually affect change here. Is it in the way they talk? Is it following and platforming and echoing the dissidents that do get their message out? Give the normal folks a thing or two they can do, like on their social media, that would actually do some good here and not just yelling at the TV about how wrong it all is. Yeah, that's a great question. I think the number one thing that someone who is not intimately connected to these issues can do is to fight the apathy and the way that you fight apathy is continuing to talk about the human rights abuses that are happening, continuing to platform dissidents and the people who actually are being intimately affected by these anti-democratic actors and fighting against the kind of everyday apathy of, well, that's thousands of miles away. It doesn't affect me because in reality, it does. Every time you go to the pump, and the price is above $4, you can point to, you know, the instability that's been caused by Russia. It's, it's an everyday thing. It's for everyone. So you may think that you don't have a dog in the fight, but in the end, you do. You may not be as intimately connected as someone, you know, in Kiev or someone in Aleppo or someone in a diaspora community, but you are being affected by the actions of these regimes every single day. And you should be putting an effort to making sure other people know that too. Yeah, that's really well put, my friend. Kareem Rafai joining us. Um, we're going to have you back because these issues are universal. They're not going away. They look like they're accelerating in a lot of ways. But I also take some hope here because I think the reason some of this is accelerating is because I think some of these regimes are legitimately scared, especially Putin, especially the Iranian regime. Uh, China's not going anywhere, but they obviously have a long-term plan that they worry about it. So we have to have hope because if they're worried, that means that there's hope. Um, until we get you back, though, let folks know where they can follow you. We're going to link to this piece. It's a great piece. There's a lot of links inside the piece. Make sure you read those as well. Read it for yourself. Share it with folks. Make up your own mind. We'll link to that in the show notes. Let folks know where they can follow you and what you have going on until they see you the next time we get you on Hurt Tale. 
Um, I'm at Kareem Rafai on Twitter and Instagram. That's K-A-R-E-E-M, like the basketball player, R-I-F-A-I. Uh, great information today. Important topic. Really enjoyed having you. We will have you back. Thank you so much for the time, my friend. Thank you so much for having me. Yes, sir. We might have heard tell. Grace is joining us. Francis is joining us. They're both from the Dissident Project. Um, Grace, real quick, we just heard her, you know, more of her story and what's going on in Hong Kong. It's not just Hong Kong. We have multiple people in the Dissident Project um, from all over different parts of the world. The theme that goes across all of these, whether it's Venezuela, whether it's Hong Kong, whether it's North Korea, authoritative dictatorships who need power and they have to crush dissent and they have to crush other people's freedoms to keep that power. This is universal through human history. It's always going to be this way throughout human history, I think. How do you tell that part of the story that, hey, this isn't just some ideological term we throw around on social media. This is a part of the human experience for as long as we have recorded human history. And it's happening right now to real life people that through technology you can talk to like Francis. Yeah. Absolutely. Um, I think in addition to, uh, you know, the dissidents telling their personal stories, which is uh, an incredibly important part of this, um, they also talk about the technical details of uh, how these authoritarian governments uh, begin, how they take over, um, how socialism leads to communism, the economic, the economic implications of these systems uh, for the citizens of their home countries. Um, and so it's not just uh, that they're telling their personal stories, but they really are reaching back into history and talking about how these things happen, um, how uh, people groups become oppressed, uh, how countries fall into authoritarian rule. And Francis, we know the history of how Hong Kong fell under authoritative rule. We know, you know, it was British. Now the Chinese have control of it. What's the future? And I don't I don't want to be bleak about it, but, you know, the, the Communist Chinese Party is very ingrained. They're not going anywhere anytime soon. What's the immediate future of Hong Kong? Are, are they going to get even more freedoms taken away? What's the status right now today? Because like we mentioned before, the Western media has kind of stopped covering it, unfortunately, since probably the, the 2019 where we had those visual things. What's been going on since then and what do you anticipate in the near future? Well, as I said, on a on a civil activity level, there's none. There's no um, protest going on in the streets. Um, and but then I also want to mention that I think there are still resistance uh, among the people. You know, you can you can shut people's mouth like all of a sudden and erase their memories. I think that's something we can hold hope on, and. Um, when there is such a huge um, oppression that exists in, in the city, that's when arts start to evolve and that's when create like creation starts to come out and we see many people start to um, pay more attention to local arts and local music and you know just everything that's coming out from Hong Kong because they know that's what they can what our national identity is contained to um and they start to embrace more about the local culture and that's how they practice and how they really lift their identity out as a hong konger so you see there are a lot of different art different um special unique things that comes out from the city and our parts in XL is to promote about it and to, you know, amplify that um, because the people back people in Hong Kong they do not get as much exposure and attention as they have before, um, and I think even now, like within arts, you can see people's voice are continue they are continuing to speak up and 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 to 
to, and then to say the values they 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 want to embrace. So um, when you look at little things and basically things that comes out from the city, it's very it's just amazing. And I I think um, that's the thing that we can look forward to. And who knows? Like I think back in 2014, I didn't imagine that something as big as as massive as the 2019 movement would happen. So perhaps we can have hope that in the future, something like that could happen even, and, and something even bigger, we don't know. And I can only tell you that, you know, for people like us outside, we have the responsibility to amplify their voice and to uh, continue to bring attention to them. And that's why I'm with the dissident project because I want to tell the story of Hong Kong basically. Are are you aware of that as you do your advocacy? And I, I know we're talking with Grace, you know, the way you've built the dissident project, it's going to be very online. It's very multimedia. It's multi-platform. We call it on purpose. Are you, are you cognizant of that? It's like, you don't really know what's going to break through, not just the Hong Kong, but the Chinese people themselves. I know they keep a real tight lock on the technology, but you never know what might get through and you never know who might get to see it. And that little sliver, like, like, for example, when Speaker Pelosi went to Taiwan and, and the CCP just absolutely freaked out, you know, we kind of say it's like, it's not just that they're free. That scares them to death because somebody might see that and they might see somebody that's free and they might see a country that's free and something. Are you really cognizant of that? It's like, every time I do this, every time I make a YouTube video, every time I do an interview, you just never know what might slide through and inspire that one more person. Yeah. Absolutely. Like they would send millions of people online, like robots to comment under your video and to basically send you, create a huge backlash online against your video or anything that you do. And that's when you know, oh, this is something they care about and they're scared of. And so we would do that more. Um, I can, you know, a lot of times sanctions does help. Um, sometimes when they're trying to do evil things and little things and they thought no one is going to pay attention to and we reveal that truth they are scared too so um i you know i we will just continue to do that more often you know yeah i've had a few run-ins with those state-sponsored tag twitter accounts uh once or twice because i don't care i say what i think of them and they know exactly where i stand on that grace you have to know that though when you put this project together they are very the the cp propaganda online it's very active there's a lot of bots out there they have a lot of malicious stuff out there you got to be aware of that when you put this project together it's like this isn't just going to be us talking to kids this is a worldwide audience and there's some really bad people just going to be watching us and not liking what we're doing too right oh yeah yes we're very aware um and i think uh being strategic with our language um has been really important for us not only as we consider those different factors, which are huge and the safety of our distance, which is huge, um, but also reaching as many people as possible, right? We wanna reach people in the movable middle. Uh, we want to talk about human rights abuses. We wanna talk about liberty. We want to use language that will be as uh, accessible as possible for as many people as possible. So we're being very cognizant of all of those different factors. Yeah, it's a tough road to hoe because you just you want to say certain things to people that are just that out and out wicked. But at the same time, you got to understand there's another audience. So God bless you for walking that hard line. Uh, we're going to take one more quick break. We come back. We're going to kind of wrap this up a little bit more about the dissident project. We're going to talk about those kids they are going to be talking to in the schools, the reactions, what it's like to talk to them, what it brings up in the people to do it. Because sometimes we just see the people standing in front of the room and, and you need to know what it feels like to stand up there. I've had to do that a little bit myself sometimes. More with Grace, more with Francis. So we continue her tell right after this. Uh, welcome back to Herd Tell, talking to our good friends, Grace and Francis, the Dissident Project. Um, Francis, when you go to something like a school or even like a college or something like this, and you have that room full of people and they're just staring at you, 
you you know you've got a message that matters. You know this is life and death stuff to the people of Hong Kong. What goes through your mind in that minute before you kind of get into your your routine and the things you normally say? And you just got all those people staring at you, and you're. Do you feel the weight of it? Does it hit you like, oh, what am I doing here? This this is not exactly what my life plan was. <laughs> well, I would say all the activists or dissidents that come out from our country. Did not imagine that we we're living the life that we're living right now. That's one thing. I have my own dream, and that's not something related to politics, obviously. Um, and I didn't imagine myself would be standing in front of the classroom and talking to a bunch of students about Hong Kong. And um, but that's what I have to do, right? And so I, I remind myself what I'm here for, um, not just for my people. It's not like I am. A great leader that is, it's like living a life against what I, against my will. It's it's really for myself and for people I care. And you know, I have family and friends back home in Hong Kong, and those are the people that keep me fighting um, till now. So um, I just remind myself, like you know, this is what I'm here for, and I'm, I'm gonna gonna do great. And if they're gonna stare at me continually. Then I would be, you know, I, I, I would just tell them, you know, let's put, 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 put yourself in my shoes and think about what it would be like to live a life that without freedom, a life that you would scare to death that one day the police are gonna knock on your door and take your parents away. That's it, you know, and that's the life that many dissidents are living, and and people living under, um, a communist rule are facing. So. Um, once you tell that kind of scenario and that kind of story, um, you're going to capture their attention. Yeah. I hate to correct guests. I rarely do it, but you're wrong, by the way. You are a great leader. Uh, <laughs> just so you know, and somebody tells you publicly, great. Uh, welcome back to Herd Tell. Okay, we got Daniel Chan Contreras. We're talking the uh, immigrant. Uh, I don't even know what we need an overarching term for this because we have the Martha Vineyard part, we got the bus part, we got the vice president house part, we got the New York part, the DC part. In that part of the problem, though, is because this thing unthreads so many different ways and the stunts become the thing. And then that's all anybody ever talks about. And now they're, you know, here in another day or two, everybody will forget about it and move on. Like you said, though, this is a constant problem. Yeah, yeah, it is. Um, as, according to Border Patrol, 50,499 encounters were from Venezuelans in fiscal year 21, 155,553 this fiscal year, which hasn't ended. And we already have approximately 300,000 Venezuelans who have requested uh, temporary protective status. It is a ongoing problem, and it's an ongoing problem that has been caused by the Venezuelan situ the political situation back home, back in Venezuela. And this is something, by the way, which I think, Andrew, is really important to, to, to point out here, <clears throat> and one of the things that really concerns me uh, is the way Republicans have been framing the issue in Venezuelans. Because, of course, since these stunts are made to highlight the problem of the border, which is a, it's a disaster, and of course, to highlight hypocrisy of Democrat majors and all that, which I understand it's a political ploy that's a fair many points. The problem here is that we are now, Republicans are now confounding the Venezuelan issue with illegal immigrants, right? After years of them being, of they saying, oh, the Venezuelan situation is so bad, communism is so bad, socialism is so bad, this is what socialism causes to a country, it destroys a country, and the Venezuelan people are now suffering from it. And that was all good, all good or great, and actually it was true and, and empathetic. And they say somehow say the same thing about Cubans. Cubans are not uh, refugees, are not illegal immigrants, are refugees because they, they're escaping a communist dictatorship. Oh, but the Venezuelans who are ox, who are also being ruled by a similar uh, dictatorship, they are illegal immigrants just because, of course, the ploy requires them to be illegal immigrants, right? So that's what actually concerns me quite a lot. That the Republican Party, who has been quite consistent on the way that characterized the Venezuelan crisis, now in these moments, because of course the political necessities dictate in that way. They changed a little bit the tune. It's like, oh, Venezuelans are no longer 
uh, you know, like kind of victims of communism, the more another illegal immigrants are coming to the country. That's something that I consider it's uh, worrisome as a, as a Venezuelan and as a conservative as well. Here's the thing. Let's be adults here. When whoever planned this for, and I know DeSantis and Governor Abbott and Governor DeSantis, they're getting the flag because these are their programs. They pro they didn't handpick these folks. Somebody in their chain of command and their staffs did this. Somebody purposefully said, let's get the Venezuelans for this. They did that purposefully. They didn't get, you know, folks from any other country. They didn't use uh, Mexicans. They didn't use any other group. I know it's speculation. I don't think that's accidental. It can't be accidental of all the folks down there. They know the asylum process is more legally fraught. They know it's more complicated. They know that the uh, the situation of these folks is a little different. Why did they pick the Venezuelan folks for this, do you think? Because it's happened more than once now, so it's not accidental. Yeah. Yeah, it's happened in a while. I mean, actually, the majority of people being bust around, it's not like only Martha's Vineyard or the vice president's home. It's like majority of them are Venezuelans. Uh, I wouldn't know. And as you said, it's speculative. I don't know the inner and outs and like the process it works. But my working theory is basically most Venezuelans who cross the border immediately ask for asylum. I mean, they cross the border and immediately ask for asylum because that's the way that that migratory flow is working, right? So when, when when you ask for asylum, of course, you have to report to to government, basically. Right? You have to report to uh, border agents. You have to report to immigration officers in some ways. That makes the Venezuelan pool of, uh, of, of migrants or refugees easier to detect, basically, than those from other countries that don't try to uh, claim asylum and try to actually uh, go into the country without being caught by migrant um, immigration officers. That's what I think, first one. And the second one, of course, as you said, the situation is quite fraught. Venezuelans, we are very new at this, uh, are trying to get this, uh, um, trying to get uh, of crossing the border. This is not a history of Venezuelan crossing the U.S. border. So, of course, people who come here can be easily dissuaded to try to go and pick a bus. Maybe it works for them, actually. Maybe they want to go to New York, whatever. The situation is fraught. A lot of them probably don't know a lot of English. And, you know, it's a, a bit easier to get them to, uh, uh, to agree. Probably a lot of them do agree and just want to go further north and like they say, okay, I'll pick the free the free ride. So I think it's a combination of both factors. One, that the Venezuelan pool is easier to detect. That's my working theory. I don't know if it's true. I don't know if it's not true. It's just completely speculative. And the second one is, of course, the situation is a little bit more fraud. A lot of Venezuelans, it's the first time they're doing from the United States. They don't have a lot of people who are trying to, it's just not a history, right? Of Venezuelans trying to cross into the United States through the Rio Grande. So it's easier for them to um, believe anything really what they think. sad truth of this, um, Daniel Chang Contreras joining us. The sad truth of this is I think everybody got what they wanted out of this episode, the Martha's Vineyard episode. You know, this Governor DeSantis, he got his national pub. The anti-immigration folks got to throw a big fit. The pro-immigration fans got to say, oh, look how well we treated these people before we, you know, shipped them off to Cape Cod, which, by the way, that's that's been a refugee place for years and years and years. That's, that's, that's exactly where you put somebody like that. So that was all noise, too, by the way. Um, what do we do now? Because everybody got what they wanted out of this story, this is going to happen again. They're going to oh, keep yeah. doing this. Everybody, both sides, they're going to keep doing yeah, yeah, this yeah. because everybody got what they wanted out of it. So what do we do next time? Because there's going to be a next time. Well, that's that's something that really concerns me is the fact that it will continue happening. Venezuelans are now, now part of the American political game, sometimes very political toxic game uh between democrats and republicans and there will not be a policy and that's something that i said in a in twitter thread it was in spanish but i'll try to translate it the fact that this martha's veneer episode beside the hypocrisy of both parties and all that shows that there is a lack of policy a lack of coherent policy by the united states government to attend the biggest humanitarian crisis in the western hemisphere and it will continue going on this way you will see more buses going being shipped to uh, Washington to New York to other blue cities. Blue cities will, you know, do a photo up and say we treated them well and they shipped them off. Um, but the reality is that Venezuelans will still be the victims after this. I mean, the consequences of this is that Venezuelan asylum seekers do not have. There is not a policy to uh, take care of the Venezuelan refugee problem. And now that it's become politicized, 
there's even less chances for there to be a coherent policy response to the Venezuelan refugee crisis. A crisis that, and I really want to really point this out again and again and again and again, is not a unique American situation. It has been going on in the entire continent for years. 6.8 million people in the last four to five years, that's a quarter of the population. That's like if 80 to 90 million Americans left in four years. That's the, the, the situation. That's the, uh, it is almost at the same size as the Ukraine and the Syrian refugee crisis without a war. That's the size of the problem we're talking about. Americans only get the little bit of it four years later, and it got um, it caught the American government and the political establishment uh, off guard. Yeah. Um, to put a bow on this, you tweeted about this extensively. I'm going to paraphrase and condense this because this Twitter thread was in Spanish, and a lot of us don't hobble off, so you tell me if I'm wrong on any of this. <laughs> but I'm going to try to paraphrase some of what you were getting to. And basically what you started driving at, because you started getting pushback on Twitter and you started responding to it, a lot of the same tropes we hear about the southern border is like, oh, well, Venezuelans, they're just sending us, you know, they're emptying their prisons and sending us all their bad folks. Or And then you went, and this one really hit me because I think you're right. I think this is going to happen. I'm going to quote you here, and this is the Google Translate. So if it's a little off, you tell me. <laughs> but it, it said, in two years, you're going to see Republicans. And again, they've always said, these are communist refugees. We need to help these people. What's going on in Venezuela? Correctly, what's going on in Venezuela is a humanitarian tragedy. This was one of the richest nations in the world through uh, natural resources in other ways, and they completely wrecked the economy in basically one decade. You said several Republicans, you're going to start seeing them say, well, Venezuela isn't really that bad, that it's been fixed. Why not just make them all go back? I'm afraid you're right, but I'm afraid you're right because we're starting to hear that about Cuba. We've started to hear that about other places that uh, legal immigrants even come to. There's this real hardcore wing, and it's always been there. You can go back to the 1880s and see the exact same propaganda of, well, you're native born or you need to go back. That kind of garbage. I think you're right, because we've seen this over and over again all throughout American history where you have this anti le And again, I'm not talking about illegal immigration, which is a problem that needs to be dealt with. Legal immigration, asylum seekers, refugees that we probably should be doing some kind of accommodation for. I think you're right to say that. What are you watching for in the next, you know, like we said, they're going to keep doing these events. What are you watching for in the next few years that are going to be warning signs that the tide like that is turning? Well, I think one of the most important things to note will be the way and the narrative that turns the uh, that Republican and conservative media outlets use to describe the Venezuelan situation, right? Until now, until a couple of months, it was always, Venezuela was used as a talking point for a campaign speech saying, this is how, what socialism does. It's really bad. People are fleeing for their lives or escaping a communist regime, which this is all true. But if that tone when they talk about Venezuela, changes from this is an example of what socialism can do to, oh, look, this is another example of what Biden failed immigration policy has done. And they're bringing uh, criminals and all that. There's this bright bar report that uh, came out saying about talking about that, which I think is really inconsistent and intrinsic. If this is the new talking point when they talk about Venezuela, just the migratory issue and completely forget the root cause of the problem, which is communism, socialism. If that's going on, then I'm afraid the Republican uh, talking points and the Republican rhetoric on Venezuela will change drastically and will go on and will, they will just simply lump it in as it was another immigration problem of, like I don't know, Mexico and, and El Salvador or Guatemala or whatever. Yeah, and this is a problem, whether it's immigration, education, spending, whatever. When you start lumping things into buzzwords, you don't get any kind of good policy out of that because these things are complicated and you got to turn the noise down. That's why I have people like you on my friend, Daniel Chan Contreras, joining us. Uh, till we get you back, I'm going to have you back because we're going to keep talking about this. This is going to continue to be an issue, unfortunately, for the Venezuelan people. Uh, let folks know where they can follow you, what you got going on. We're going to, we got your social media up on the screen. Let folks know what you got going on until they see you on Hertel again, my friend. Uh, yeah, you can uh, you guys can follow me on, on Twitter. Um, I usually post my thoughts over there, both in, in Spanish and English. And also write for El American, which is a conservative media outlet aimed at, at Hispanics. I occasionally write there. So anything that I post, I'll post it over there. Great job, buddy. Good information. Love talking. Good time. We'll do it again real soon, sir. Thank you so much for the time. Thank you, Andrew. Thank you very much. Yes, All the music on her tell is provided under a creative content license from monstercat.com. Vacation starts with VA. Whether you're feeling beachy, mountainy, 
or every E in between. You'll find all that you love all in one trip to Virginia. Start yours at virginia.org.